Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last uh, full day uh, of new material for the semester. Uh, congratulations for making it this far. Today, we're going to be finishing up our discussion by looking at Iris Marion Young's work on responsibility. Uh, so thinking about how we can apply some of the political and theoretical concepts uh, about responsibility that we've looked at, about justice that we've looked at, um, and structures of injustice to think about what responsibilities we as individuals and we in our communities bear to responding to structural injustice. Um, so we're going to think about explaining and evaluating uh, young, Iris Young's theory of political responsibility and thinking about how it can apply to contemporary political questions. And that's what the discussion posts are going to focus on uh, for you for today. Um, so Young is building on Arendt's idea that we need ways of thinking about responsibility that are not reducible to individual intention. That as the Eichmann trial uh, demonstrated in vivid detail, that intending to cause harm or having malicious intent are not sufficient criteria for responsibility when we're talking about something like, uh, like these uh, horrendous crimes of the Holocaust. But what Young is arguing, um, and what Arendt does not really have the theoretical resources to think about are what people would call ordinary injustices, what Judith Sklar, the uh, late American political theorist, would call an ordinary injustice. And this is an injustice that is not at the scale of the Holocaust, not at the scale of the not uh, of the crimes that Eichmann was guilty of, but yet nevertheless can, has similar features in which that these are not these are complex. They involve multiple people interacting. Um, that no one person is directly responsible for causing the harm, and most people participate within these uh, structures without intending to cause harm. And so I, uh, Young just develops this idea of a structural injustice that exists, according to her, when processes, uh, uh, when social processes put uh, persons or groups under systematic threat of domination or deprivation of the means of developing uh, and exercising their capacities, at the same time that these processes enable others to develop or to dominate or to have a wide range of opportunities for developing and exercising capacities available to them. Structural injustice occurs as a consequence of many individuals and institutions acting to pursue their particular goals and interests, for the most part within the limits of accepted rules and norms. So structural injustices occur in this mindset when our ordinary behavior, buying groceries, buying clothes, uh, driving to work, uh, sending our children to school, etc., all are moral and just and justified and well-intentioned, um, but because of the way that these structures are built, they systematically allow some people to benefit disproportionately and dominate others, um, and while others are dominated and are excluded from the same types of opportunities and benefits. Uh, so I encourage you to think about some examples of structural injustices in your own life, and I'm going to ask you to do this more um, more concretely in the discussion threads. But Young uses the example of garment production in, in her article, right? So we can all kind of assume it's a fairly uh, straightforward story here. Um, many of us buy clothes uh, from fast, fa fast fashion outlets, things like uh, Gap um, or other kind of you know mass-produced clothing that is cheap and affordable. Um, that it, but it is produced in uh, in developing economies and in many in many cases in substandard uh, working conditions by people working for barely any but for well below a living wage um, and in unsafe and unhealthy work conditions and I'm putting um, I'm putting a link to this video on um, on the Moodle page this video that has disappeared here um, because the videos don't always work well when I uh, record them this uh, screen record them, um, but it's on the, the Rana Plaza collapse from a few years ago in Bangladesh. Uh, and th so thinking about how um, the, the, the level of, of wor uh, 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 workers' rights and, and the conditions in these, in, in these garment factories, to think about how um, this is really not just simply like a inequality, but is much closer to an, is much more of an injustice, that this is a form of exploitation and domination, not just inequality. So Young's question, Right, and she's kind of motivated by this response that all of us have. Um, am I responsible for these injustices? Um, so am I responsible for worker suicides um, in, in, in factories, uh, in iPhone factories when I use an iPhone? Am I responsible for sweatshop labor when I buy a t-shirt at Gap? Uh, and most of us would probably say we're not guilty of this. Um, it's not my fault. I'm not the one who uh, enforced, created these conditions. I'm not the one who owns these factories. I might have my own um, needs or constraints. I might 
might only I might need to uh, I might need affordable clothing to put clothes for, provide clothing for my family. Um, but Young is arguing that even that we need to separate this idea of, of guilt and fault from responsibility. Um, that these structural injustices are probably not our fault. That we are not causally or directly guilty. Uh, or, or in that sense of responsibility for causing these injustices. But that doesn't mean that we don't have some sense of responsibility, um, that we are responsible for things that are not our fault. And so, she, and she develops this way of thinking uh, through what she calls a, a social connections model of political responsibility. So she argues that all the persons who participate by their actions in ongoing schemes of cooperation that constitute these structures are responsible for them, in the sense that they are part of the processes that cause them. They are not responsible in the sense of having directed the process or intending the outcomes. So we're not guilty in the sense that like, we would be sent to prison, that we should be morally blamed for Young, but we are responsible because our, our participation in global supply chains, for example, our participation in unjust practices of school funding, for example, um, maintain and perpetuate these structures, that they would not continue without people willingly uh, and participating in, in, in these processes. And so she argues that we need to think of responsibility based on what she calls social connections, that we bear a responsibility for structural injustices because they contribute with our, we contribute with our actions to the processes that produce unjust outcomes. Our responsibility derives from belonging together with others in a system of interdependent processes of cooperation and competition through which we seek to benefit, seek benefits and aim to realize projects. That we are connected but when we purchase a t-shirt, we are connected to the entire chain of uh, production and distribution and consumption, uh, and therefore that we then bear responsibility for injustices that are produced by that supply chain, that are produced in that supply chain, that even though we may not have ever met or will never meet the people who produce the clothing, who uh, grow our food, who raise our livestock, it's, uh, in, in other cases, that are our ordinary legal and moral, like there's nothing immoral about purchasing food or purchasing clothing, um, but that we enter into connections with other people through these ordinary processes. And those connections generate responsibility because we gain benefits from them and we are participating in these processes that we that creates a sense of responsibility that we as individuals and we as in our communities have to rectifying those injustices, to finding ways to reform these structures, to make them less ex exploitative, less dominating. So how is this? model of responsibility distinct. What she does is she compares it to what she calls the liability model, which is our normal way of thinking about responsibility, that individuals intend to indirectly cause some harm and they should be um, held criminally or legally li or civilly liable for the harm that they produce. Um, and so she distinguishes it in several ways. First, she argues that when the harms of uh, that when harms result from the participation of thousands or millions of people and in institutions and practices that produce unjust results, an isolating conception of responsibility is inadequate. That, that we need to have a non-isolating conception of responsibility because not every injustice is caused by a single party. And then when we find a single person to blame, like the CEO of Gap or the factory owner uh, of the factories that collapsed or um, the governments in, in developing countries that well, do not enforce labor laws, that that's letting everyone else in the supply chain off the hook when we find some one person because it's no one person is themselves caused the problem. Furthermore, this kind of isolating idea of liability um, that like finding the one guilty party intent generates resentment that when we are told that we are solely guilty that we can come become resentful of our responsibilities and less likely to take it. Second, she argues that the social connection model brings into question precisely the background conditions that descriptions of blame and or fault assume as normal. That rather than assuming that injustices are the result of deviations from ordinary moral behavior, um, that injustices are, are produced by ordinary moral and normal conditions, that we are actually evaluating the, the, the the normal way of the business as usual, the normal way of doing things and what is usually accepted as moral and legal. Um, and so we're trying, um, what Young is arguing is that we need to evaluate these background conditions. Uh, um, we can't simply um, treat these as acceptable and then punish people who act immorally by deviating from them.
The third is that she argues that this is much more of a forward looking than backward looking. That when we are assigning liability, we're looking backwards to try to figure out who caused the harm that we are that we are concerned about and how can we rectify or punish that. Um, Instead, uh, this, um, this political responsibility, this social connections model says that what we should think about is what we can do going forward. How can we correct? How can we make the system more just, more equitable, more, uh, more, more um, fair, uh, less dominating, less exploitative? Um, and so this is, instead of saying that we should blame or guilt some people for something wrong that they've done in the past, it's finding ways to uh, motivate and generate action. And the fourth is the idea that uh, that, that uh, contribute contribution to processes uh, of unjust structure structural injustices create a shared sense of responsibility that we all share this responsibility that this is collective not individual that we don't bear this responsibility as individuals but we share it with everyone else participating in these supply chains and for young this means that even victims can share in responsibility um, their responsibility might is going to be different than ours um, as as we'll talk about in just a second but this does not this is all about everyone who's involved in a structure in a social structure uh, system share that responsibility and we discharge that responsibility in fifth through collective political action that is not by repaying debts or punishing ourselves or feeling guilty but that we work together to change institutions to pass new laws to put pressure on corporations to change their practices and policies to empower activists in uh, in in labor activists in the developing world um, to finding ways to support um, the work that they're doing that we are it's it's collective public political action um, that, that is not about like oh well I'll just buy less um, clothing from Gap and um, or I'll just simply um, make all my own clothing right that that's not that doesn't actually solve the injustice that what we actually need to do is work together to create new institutions new uh, new ways of being new political and economic practices uh, new social norms and values and that's always going to be a collective action. We, ha we can't do any of that by ourselves. But she argues that this shared collective sense of responsibility does not, should not be interpreted as equality. That everyone shares responsibility who participates in a structural injustice does not mean that everyone equally shares responsibility for a structural injustice. And so, so she identifies what she calls different uh, parameters of reasoning, and we can call these degrees of responsibility. One is power, that the more power you have, the more resources, the more prestige you have within a structure based on your position within the structure, that you're going to have more responsibility. If you're the CEO of a company, you have more responsibility than someone who is working in one of your factories. If you are a wealthy consumer, you have more responsibility uh, by virtue of your greater purchasing power uh, than someone who is buying um, cl cheap clothes because that is all they can afford. Second is privilege, and this is thinking about the differential benefit from one's structural position. Some of us benefit more from our participation in unjust structures than others. Um, if you are benefiting, if you are making lots of money as a shareholder to one of, to a large multinational corporation, um, that, that, that makes its pro whose profits are predicated on poor labor conditions in the developing world, then you are benefiting directly from the from these this injustice that your privilege is predicated on that injustice and you have a greater responsibility uh, she also argues that we are going to divide our responsibility different based on differential interest that not everyone is going to have the same interest in in, in, in taking responsibility and that means that people with greater interest people probably people who are benefiting the least from responsibility are going to be the most motivated to take action and so what, what their kind of the goal here is that young argues that those with the most interest are, are going to have to target the people uh, those with the uh, greatest power and the greatest privilege because that is how they're going to create uh, structural change. And finally, she looks at collective ability, and she's arguing here that some of us are already kind of within, have existing connections and social organizations and social groups are connected to social movements and have a greater collective ability to mobilize political action and to mobilize other people to take action um, than others. And so for for young, this means that we that those with greater collective ability have a greater obligation to, to initiate action. And so, young is de in, in in the book version of, of this argument. Young makes develops this uh, her social connections model by thinking through Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, and she argues that in Eichmann in Jerusalem, Arendt is actually describing four different ways of thinking about responsibility. 
Um, on the one hand, she's describing those who are guilty of mass murder and for which she includes Eichmann. Um, so it's not just the people who um, pull, who, who directly ec oversee the, ex the mass execution and genocide and the extermination camps, but it's also those who create the policies like Eichmann um, and enforce the policies who, who, who uh, uh, directly contribute to mass murder. So there, these are guilty people who are guilty, and they should still be punished according to Young and according to our, our end um, for these crimes, right? They, they should be held liable. They should be punished as individuals. Then she's arguing that there are people within Germany who are not guilty. They did not directly cause or authorize uh, the Holocaust, but they still bear responsibility. And here, Eichmann, or sorry, Young and Arendt are looking, thinking about the, the German supporters of the Nazi regime who, who supported the Nazi regime um, despite uh, uh, um, and even if they weren't members of the SS, even if they had nothing to do directly with the Holocaust, that they provided political support. Um, and this is uh, 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 Arendt's idea that like obedience and support are the same. Um, that these German supporters of the Nazis are are, are their responsibility, um, but they are not guilty, and those who uh, and that, that they should bear this political responsibility. The third category that Jung discusses with reference to Arendt is those who have tried to avoid guilt or an attempt to prevent harm. So this includes those who fled Nazi Germany, uh, artists who refused to paint propaganda, um, those who refused to join the SS, um, these conscientious objectors. But these people did not actually contest the, unjust, the injustice of the Holocaust. Uh, they did not attempt to actually cause political action. But what they tried to do is reduce um, their, th these people here tried to reduce their responsibility responsibility here, that they tried to extricate themselves from the social connections in Jung's language. And finally, um, Jung, looking at Eichmann and, and, and Jerusalem, uh, identifies some examples of those who actually took political responsibility. And here she's looking at Arendt's discussion of Danish resistant to ger resistance to German expulsions, including dock workers who went on strike rather than participate in the movement of, of, of Jews uh, throughout, throughout Europe, uh, who, the refusal of, of the Danish government to participate in, in the Nazi pro program of mass expulsions, um, that these people are actually taking a stand and trying to actually correct and rectify an injustice. So, so Jung and Arendt are here in dialogue here, but what Jung is trying to do is expand what Arendt, Arendt's conception of um, of responsibility and injustice, and even this idea of the banality of evil, to suggest that it, the banality of evil is far more thoroughgoing than even Arendt suggested, that it occurs even in our everyday lives, in our everyday participation in unjust structures. So next class um, on Monday, we're going to wrap up um, our kind of study of political theory, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what what the value and point of studying political theory is. And I've changed the readings a little bit from the original syllabus. I'm asking you to read two short pieces. Uh, this piece from John Rawls, Four Rules for Political Philosophy, is, is like four pages. It's very it's very short. And, and Bell Hooks Theory as Liberatory Practice, to think about like what role theory can play in society, in, 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 our, in scholarship, in your studies, uh, and what the benefit of this, this what we've been doing all semester are, is. Um, and finally, for your discussion thread for this evening, uh, I'd like you to describe something today that would qualify as what Jung calls a structural injustice. Based on her social connections model, who bears responsibility to rectify this injustice? And does it include you? As a reminder, 200, the, your responses to either one of the two discussion threads for this week, 200-word uh, posts are due by Friday at midnight, and your 100-word replies are due by Sunday at midnight. So that's going to wrap it up for today's lecture. Um, as always, if you have any questions or comments about the material, concerns about finishing any of the assignments, uh, please let me know as soon as you can. Send me an email, drop by in office hours, join us in the discussion section. I'm happy to kind of clarify things or make exceptions and accommodations that are appropriate. Stay safe, keep washing your hands, keep social distancing, take care of each other, and I'll see you on Monday for our last class.